Hello, it's Scott Manley here and welcome to Going Nuclear Part 4. Today we're going to talk about the evolution of fission weapons from those early World War II designs to lighter, more compact devices and taking the first steps towards utilising fusion. After World War II, the Manhattan Project wound down and many of the scientists returned to civilian life. But an equal number of smart scientists remained on to improve those weapons. Now, improve is a kind of nebulous statement because there are many possible goals. Increasing yield, reducing the size or mass, cutting the cost, and increasing safety. Now, most of these goals are synergistic because a technology that increases the efficiency of the fission can equally be applied to increasing the yield or reducing the material requirements. The Little Boy was a terribly inefficient weapon, and while a handful more were built, they were quickly retired so that their fissile material could be reused in dozens of other warheads. The Fat Man design, it became the Mark III, and over a hundred of those were built, up until about 1949 when it was eventually replaced by the Mark IV. While the Mark IV was similar in size and mass to the Mark III, it did include a few innovations which were tested as part of Operation Sandstone. The pits tested were no longer pure plutonium or pure plut uh, uranium. There were a composite core made of about a two-thirds uranium, one-third plutonium to make best use of the materials that they had available to them. They also made use of levitated pits. Now that's where the pit uh, is now has a, an air gap between it and the uranium tamper. The, the pit is suspended by wires and during the implosion, this allows the tamper to pick up more momentum before colliding with the core. And the effect is apparently an increase in overall compression and therefore higher efficiency in the weapon in the explosion. Now this may sound like a small detail, but having air gaps inside the implosion system uh, turns up all over the place and it was actually classified until 1980. And this classified status does mean that many of the things I'm interested in are not in the public sphere. There's lots of innovations that are still classified, some things observers think they know and others which are really a result of educated guesses based upon other knowledge and physics. It's worth noting that a lot of the detail about Little Boy and Fat Man actually came from trials of spies in the 1950s. At that point, the government decided that the value of keeping this information secret was outweighed by its value to the prosecution. The US was of course no longer alone in developing nuclear technology. In 1949, the Soviet Union developed and detonated their first weapon. In 1952, the UK joined the club and uh, later they would be joined by France, China, India, South Africa, Pakistan, and most recently, North Korea. They've all built and tested their own devices at one point, but in all cases, secrecy is high and detailed information is thin on the ground. Anyway, the next optimization I want to cover is hollow pits. Now, the early pits were solid with a small cavity in the middle for the neutron generator, largely because the fabrication of hollow pits proved to be non-trivial. But the scientists in the Manhattan Project understood that hollow pits offered numerous advantages. Again, the hollow pit helps the critical assembly pick up extra momentum during the implosion, resulting in higher compression with all the benefits that confers. But also, on a more basic level, having a hollow core essentially reduces the density or increases the surface area of the fissile core and thus allows the weapon to contain more material without going critical. And while this isn't that interesting for modern thermonuclear devices, it was essential to early high yield pure fission devices. The largest pure fission device was the Mark 18F SOB, that's Super Orloy Bomb, which was tested under the codename Ivy King in 1952. The 3.9 ton bomb is estimated to have a 75 kilogram pit of highly enriched uranium. This would have been at least 24 centimeters in diameter and compressed using a 92 point detonation system. It generated a yield of about 500 kilotons. 
The test was actually a backup plan in case Ivy Mike, the first thermonuclear test, failed. Obviously that didn't happen, but that's a whole other episode. With so much uranium in the weapon, an accidental single point activation or even crushing of the core could make it go critical, so the safety system for the weapon required filling the hollow pit with a chain made of a boron alu aluminium alloy, which would inhibit the implosion and also absorb neutrons. Also, some UK hollow core designs would, would fill the cavity with ball bearings, which could then be drained out prior to arming the weapon. As an aside, high yield pure fission weapons use uranium instead of plutonium because when you're assembling multiple critical masses, you run into the same kind of pre-detonation problems that made the thin man non-viable. Even with the rapidity of implosion, the background neutrons from plutonium-240 are just too numerous once you have multiple critical masses trying to get together for a big nuclear party. Finally, and most significantly, hollow pits can be filled with a gas other than boring old air, such as a mixture of deuterium and tritium, ready to fuse into helium and release more energy if persuaded. And when I say persuaded, I mean compressed and heated to about 30 million Kelvin. By placing this in the middle of the pit, it will be compressed and heated by the fission reaction until it gets hot enough to begin fusing. And as well as releasing energy, it'll also release neutrons. Now deuterium-tritium fusion generates more than 10 times the number of neutrons compared to uranium or plutonium fission. This accelerates the reaction so quickly that the heavy tamper is no longer necessary to get a full yield. So fission boosting is hugely useful in shrinking weapons down since the heavy uranium tamper can be eliminated and replaced with a light beryllium neutron reflector. And in turn, this means you need fewer explosives over the top to compress it down. This is a thermonuclear reaction, but I should make it clear right away that this is distinct from a full-fledged hydrogen bomb. It only uses a few grams of fusion fuel. Less than 1% of the energy of the device will come from uh, fusion. Moving on, the neutron generator in early weapons was a pellet containing radioisotopes, but by the end of the 1950s, this had been superseded by electric pulsed neutron generators placed outside the implosion assembly. These were small particle accelerators that could uh, smash deuterium ions into tritium or vice versa, generating those high energy neutrons. Pulse neutron generators could be triggered with much more precision uh, and therefore sending neutrons into the assembly at the exact moment that they would be needed to start the reaction. Neutrons are highly penetrating radiation, so they can easily travel through huge amounts of exploding and imploding material before arriving in the, in the core to trigger the reaction. Interestingly, the pulsed neutron generator would have to be a short distance away from the actual implosion system because they would have to operate after the explosion started and before they were destroyed by the shock wave emanating from those explosives. Now those explosives might be exploding at kilometers per second, but the implosion time would be measured in a few microseconds. So it only works out to a few centimeters and it's kind of amazing to think of these delicate electronics sitting a few centimeters away from an advancing detonation wave moving at 10 times the speed of sound or more. Now the electronic timing of the neutron pulse and the fusion boosting, they also lead to the prospect of variable yield technology commonly referred to as dial a yield. By changing the amount of fusion fuel injected or the exact timing of the neutron pulse, a weapon can select different yields without requiring changing the device. For example, the B61 bomb uh, can be set to detonate with yields as low as one third of a kiloton and all the way up to 170 kilotons. That's a factor of over 500. Variable yield capability is another one of those ubiquitous features found on most modern weapons. Finally, most of the improvements in miniaturizing weapons have come from shrinking the implosion system. Remember, the pit in Fat Man was only 9 centimeters across, but it was surrounded by a 1.5 meter sphere of explosives, pushers and tampers designed to compress it down 
Now, the first significant reduction in this was a 75 centimeter package that was tested in 1951. And by 1955, they'd shrunk that down to 40 centimeters. But probably the most significant step towards modern devices came with the two-point implosion system used in the Swan device. This was tested in 1956 and it was an ovoid shape. It was about 30 centimeters uh, in the short axis and almost double this in the long axis. It had a mass of under 50 kilograms and produced a yield of about 15 kilotons. In this, the spherical implosion wave was no longer achieved using explosive lenses like those of the Fat Man. Instead, it used something called a flying plate air lens system. In this, a thin metal plate is designed to be forced into the correct shape and launched across an air gap so that it arrives at the actual implosion charge symmetrically, triggering the main implosion charge across its entire surface simultaneously. And this, of course, was shrunk down even further into something like the W54 warhead. That was the one deployed under the name Davy Crockett. Uh, and this was, of course, inspiration for the mini nuke we see in the Fallout games. Anyway, even smaller warheads have been developed using other techniques. For example, there is something called two-point uh, two linear implosion. And instead of trying to shape the explosion, the explosives into a perfect converging sphere, Instead, the pit is not spherical to start with, and it's shaped th such that it understands the, the shape of the incoming compression waves, so that when they interact with it, it squeezes it into a perfect sphere of a critical mass. And it's more about changing the shape from a, uh, an ovoid into a sphere that brings it up to the critical mass, the critical assembly. Um, the compression is relatively weak and it does mean that you need more fissile material, but it can be fitted into a 6 inch shell. A 15 centimeter diameter cylinder can contain a nuclear warhead with a yield measured in tens of kilotons. So, you know, it's crazy how small these things can be made with the right technology if you really want them. Of course, I have to reiterate, again, a lot of details are classified and there are holes in emissions that are going to be evident even in this high-level overview. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Next time, we're going to go into proper staged thermonuclear devices. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.